Psalm 51. We're going to start reading in verse 1. We'll go to verse 17. As I speak to you on this subject, a perfect heart. Now, as we read through this, you'll wonder how in the world I got that title, but if you'll give me just a little bit of time, I'll build it, and you'll see why this title is here and why this is such an important message to somebody here today. Psalm 51. As we're reading this, I want you to remember the context of uh, why and when this was being written. This is David writing. Uh, He has now been confronted by Nathan. Uh, He is a broken man. And now you're going to hear the words of his brokenness before the Lord. And it's words that he has not only prayed, but is words that I have prayed throughout the years of my walk with God. I have made many mistakes. I have fallen to temptation. And so these are the words that I have prayed in my own brokenness. And I'm sure that as you read this, uh, this will be familiar to you in your brokenness. Psalm 51, so keep that in mind as you read these words. These are the words of a heart, a life that is broken. Verse 1, David says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that you might be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Listen to verse 10. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed this. I've prayed God created me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Has your heart ever gotten hardened, church? Have you ever grown cold spiritually? Those places where you were in the dry seasons, walking through the wilderness, where you began to see your zeal for God began to wane, and you began to lose that passion and desire, saw something in your life where you say, God, you've got to create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. Verse 11 says, cast me not away from thy presence, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, Oh, I love verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Why? Verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou deliest not in burnt offering. Look at verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. May God add to the reading of his word. I hope you caught the heartbeat of David. I hope you sensed the pain of David as he was writing this. Because if we were all to be honest, and if we were to look inwardly and look at what we've done, what we've been through, the things that we have done, I'm sure that that would be our prayer. And that's what I wanted you to catch. But I also wanted you to catch this. And I want to start off before I get to describing how the Bible described David by talking about how God describes so many different people in the Bible. We find that God would describe Enoch as a man who walked with God. 
We find Job described as a man who was upright in all of his ways and one who hated evil. How many know what Elijah was described as? He was described as a man of prayer. Abraham is described as the father of faith. And I want you to catch this because as you read this, listen to what David is described as, as a man after God's own heart. Not only is David described as a man after God's own heart, but listen to this. And and we're, we're listening to this, knowing what David had done, listening to the cry of his heart. Listen to how else the Bible described David. The Bible describes him as a man who had a perfect heart. Now, how do we know that? Where you don't have to turn there, but 1 Kings 11.4, listen to these words. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. So David is described as a man after God's own heart and a man who had a heart that was perfect. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see the words perfect, immediately I think of the word impossible. I think of the phrase, not me. In fact, one of my favorite phrases that I've said so many times when I've done something stupid, maybe you've said it, well, after all, I'm not. All right, so you've said it. You understand where I'm going. So the question then is, what does it mean when the Scripture describes David as having a perfect heart? Does it mean that David lived without ever making a mistake? Does it mean living a flawless Christian existence? Because if it does, church, I'm in trouble. If that's what it means, you're in trouble. We're all in trouble. We're in trouble if God is expecting perfection. We're in trouble if God expects us to live our lives without mistakes or failures because all of us have committed them and will commit them. How is it that the Bible can describe David as having this perfect heart when we know about his failures? We know what he did with Bathsheba. We know what he did with her husband Uriah. So obviously the way that God describes a perfect heart and gives us the description of it, how he would consider a perfect heart, and how we would consider it, or how we would describe it, is two different things. And I want to show you how different they really are here this morning. If you're taking notes, or if you're on the church app, you'll find these notes on there. I want to show you a word in Hebrew that means nothing like we think it means in the, in the English language. I'm talking about the word perfect. Listen to the word perfect in Hebrew. It means to be made ready. It means to be complete or full. Now let me say it again because that has nothing to do with what we think that word perfect means. In the Hebrew, when the Bible talks about a perfect heart, that David had a perfect heart, that he was a heart after God, it means to be made ready, complete, or full. Now, if something is to be made ready or full or complete, it tells us that there is a beginning, meaning that it didn't start off that way. In other words, there was something that wasn't ready if it was to be made ready. Am I making sense, church? There had to be something empty to become full. There had to be something started before it could be described as complete. I think a great example for us to understand what I'm trying to say here is looking at an artist. Now, many times as we look at that painting, we look at it when it's complete, but we didn't see it when it was started. That artist would take that paintbrush and with one stroke begin that painting. And it would take many, many, many brush strokes before that painting became completed. And that's what God is trying to give us a picture of. That when we look at the life of David, the story of David, it wasn't a man who was perfect or didn't make mistakes. 
but it was a man who started somewhere but ended up somewhere else. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And that's the picture that God wants to give you and me. That No, listen, when we start, and I've said this over and over again, it's not how you start, church, it's how you finish. And I say that because when we start off with Christ, our life isn't very pretty. We have been disfigured by sin. Our lives are broken. They're a wreck. We live in dysfunction and depression. But church, listen, when God begins to work in our lives, and he begins to change our minds and change our hearts, and puts back things in place, who we become looks nothing like who we were. Can you say amen to that? That's why I'm thankful for Hebrews 12, too, that Jesus is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. My favorite scripture verse, Philippians 1, 6, that we can be confident in this one thing. Listen to me, church. If you're here today and you're struggling in your walk, you made some mistakes this past week. You're in the right place, by the way. You said some wordy dirties. You had some bad thoughts. You did some things you wish you wouldn't have done. Here's the key. You can be confident that he which began the good work in you will complete that work in you until the day of Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to shout amen to that. I'm thankful for that verse. And that's what God was trying to give us in this story of David. I want to look at how David was and how after everything he did, how did he get to that place? Because I want to get to that place. I want to get to that place where I'm described as a man after God's own heart. I want to get to that place where the Bible describes me as having a perfect heart. And again, we just saw the definition. It doesn't mean like we think it means. But there's a powerful meaning behind it. And we're going to dig now into David's life. And I'm going to show you and explain it because it is extremely powerful. Number one, if you're taking notes... Write this down, a perfect heart responds. A perfect heart responds. How many know the story of David? You've read it, you've heard about it. Some of you might be brand new. Maybe you've not read that story, you don't know anything about it. So let me just touch briefly. Uh, David commits adultery with Bathsheba, who uh, is married to Uriah. David has Uriah sent to the front lines, and there he is killed. Nathan, the prophet, comes to David and confronts him and what he had done. And when he confronts David, David, there you begin to see his response. He responded to this confrontation, and it begins to go to the Lord by crying out. And he tells the Lord, he said, Lord, my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. He wept so bitterly over what he had done that the Bible tells us that he would drench his bed at night. That's how much he cried and wept over the mistakes that he had made. Anywhere that you read about his story, what's so interesting is that he doesn't blame Bathsheba. He doesn't blame Uriah. He doesn't blame anybody else for what he did. He didn't push off his sin on how he was raised or what had happened in his life. He didn't blame the devil like we hear all the time. The devil made me do it. He said this. He said, I've sinned and I did this evil in God's sight. Now, church, I want you to hear me because today we don't have Nathan the prophet coming to us. But who we do have is the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he will bring conviction and he brings convincing as it reveals sin and the things in our lives in light of God's holiness. Now, church, we have a choice. We can respond by confessing our sin before God. We can respond by saying, you know what, God, against you and you alone have I done this sin and this evil in your sight. We can repent and turn from our wicked ways. And that's the response that God is looking for from us. Or, church, we can reject the prompting of the Holy Spirit. 
We can reject the preaching of the Word. We can reject the song that's on the radio. We can reject when God whispers to us in that place of dysfunction or that place of addiction or that hurt or that hang-up. And there He begins to speak to us. We can respond to it or we can reject it. If we respond, here's the promise of God, 1 John 1, 9 If if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, that's what God is looking for. He's not looking for perfection. He's looking for us to respond to him when we make a mistake, to owe up to what we have done and say, God, oh, man, I'm so sorry, Lord. I really blew it again, God. I confess it to you, knowing that if we confess it, he's faithful, church. He'll forgive you of your sin. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But church, when we reject it, please listen to me. When we refuse to hear God, because if you're a believer, God is speaking to you, whether you think that he is speaking or not. Your conscience is speaking. The Holy Spirit will come to where you are in your life and in that moment. You'll hear that small voice of God. He'll tell you no. He'll tell you yes. He'll tell you, don't, oh, don't do that. He'll warn you. He'll do everything you can. You have to fight through his voice to do what he doesn't want you to do. And the more you reject that, church, and listen, I, I want you to get a hold of this point. The more you reject God speaking to you, the more Proverbs 29, 1 comes into play. Listen to what Solomon said. He said, that person who is reproved often and hardens his heart and his neck against that reproof, that conviction, the convincing of the Holy Spirit, listen to what God says, that person will be destroyed and that without remedy. Church, listen to what God is saying. There comes a point in time in our life where we become so hard against God. We get so hard that we'll no longer hear the conviction. It will no longer matter to us because we're going to do what we want to do, whether God likes it or not. And church, we can go so far where God says, listen, I'm going to keep trying and keep trying. And it's not that God won't stop trying, but that our heart, can become so hard that we willingly turn our backs on God and we willingly go in our own direction. Are you hearing what I'm saying, church? Listen, don't let your heart get hard. And that's the warning that the writer of Hebrews gave us in Hebrews 3 and uh, chapters 4. He says, listen, don't let your heart get hard. Church, when God comes to you and he speaks to you, respond to him immediately. That's what David did. That's why he was a man after God's own heart. That's why he had a perfect heart, because a perfect heart doesn't reject God, doesn't reject the conviction. It responds to it. Can you say amen to that? Number two, if you're taking notes, a perfect heart searches. I want you to turn to Psalm 139. Keep your finger there. And Psalm 51 And this is another one that I've prayed over and over again throughout my walk with the Lord. David again. He knew he couldn't run from God, and this is what this chapter is about. He knew that no matter where he ran, he couldn't get away from God. I've told you more more times than I can count that The Holy Spirit is the heavenly hound dog. You can't run from God. You can try, but you can't. He'll come after you. And there's no place that he's barred from. He'll be in the crack house. He'll be in the bar. It doesn't matter. You can't keep the Holy Spirit out. That sin doesn't surprise him. That's what sinners do. They sin. So David then gets to the end of verse 23 and 24 of Psalm 139. And listen to what he says. He says, search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. Verse 24, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Now, that word search means to penetrate deeply. 
It means to go all the way in to the deepest recesses of that person's heart and life. Now, why did David ask God to penetrate his heart, to get all the way in, to search it, to see if there was something in him that was wicked, something that was not pleasing God? Well, David knew, and Scriptures teaches us, that the heart is full of iniquity, that the heart is full of evil and loves evil. In fact, the Bible describes the heart as a fountain of evil, that it's depraved and wayward, it's blind, it's unstable, it's deceitful and proud and hypocritical and worldly and hardened and malicious and covetous and foolish. That's how the Bible describes our hearts. In Proverbs 4.23, Solomon says that what goes in our hearts determines the course of our life. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, you can turn there later, it's in your app. Jesus said, listen, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. This is why during Lent, when people give up meat, I eat it. It gets cheaper. Nobody's buying it. I'm buying whole slabs. I'm smoking two, three slabs. Why do I do that? I'm I'm not making fun of anybody or any religion. It's because Scripture tells me it's not what goes in that defiles you. It's what comes out. That's what defiles us, church. And here Jesus said that for from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and fornications and murders and thefts and covetousness and wickedness and deceit and lasciviousness and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. One of the most powerful scripture verses you'll read in the Bible is found in Luke 6, 45. And this is why we always talk about Jesus saying, you'll know them by their fruit. Listen to this. A good person produces good things from the treasure of his good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasure of an evil heart. You see, if you've got a good heart, you'll produce that kind of life. But if you've got an evil heart, you will produce that kind of heart. So Jesus is pointing to the core and the substance of every single person. And that is the heart of that individual. That what we do, how we live, what can be seen on the outside is the direct reflection of who we are on the inside. And that's why David was crying out. He's saying, God, you got to get down to who I really am as a person. And that's why, you know, Paul talked about examining our lives. You know, we're to, we're to look deeply at ourselves, not our neighbor, not our spouse. God never said examine the pastor or his wife or family. He said examine yourself. And what did he say? Listen, see what's going on in your life. See if you're still in the faith. You see, your life, you can see what's going on in your life by what you're doing and how you're doing it and how you're thinking. And you know when something is wrong, church. And that's why we cry out, God, look at me. Something happened to me. Something's wrong with my heart. It's bitter. It's hard. It's unforgiving. God, ransack it. Go all the way down. Go deep. And Lord, take that away from me. But there's another piece of this, and I I really hope that somebody will hear this here this morning. And I want you to, man, listen with the ear of the Spirit. Because I really feel I'm going to talk to somebody in this moment. I know that all of us want God to dig deep and pull out the things that aren't pleasing to Him. I've got that. But there's another piece of this when you invite Jesus into your life. When you invite Jesus in, who you're inviting in is the healer. He's the healer. Meaning that when he comes in, 
Jesus will not let one stone go unturned. He knows exactly what you've been through. He knows what has affected your life. He knows what has hurt you. Remember that the anointing in Luke 4, 18, Jesus said, I'm here to set at liberty those that are bruised. And he wasn't talking about it, and I've explained that word bruised before. He wasn't just talking about the bruises that we can see, the bruises that are visible. He was talking about the bruises that are so deep that nobody knows that they're, that they're there but you and God. And when Jesus comes in, the healer, he goes after those bruises. The ones that are deep, the ones that the enemy has used to destroy your life and to turn you into who God never wanted you to be in the first place. That has affected you for year after year after year. And when Jesus comes in, church, he brings it out to the light. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And he doesn't do it to hurt us, church. He does it to heal us. Listen, God wants to expose everything. He doesn't want you hiding it anymore. He wants to bring it to the light because he wants to bring healing to your life. I love this part about Celebrate Recovery. And I really think it's because we don't understand the whole effect that our past and the things that have happened to us in our past are having on our lives. Listen to what Celebrate Recovery says. We are only as sick as our secrets. You see, a perfect heart, the heart that will one day be full and complete and ready is a heart that says, God, take it all. Take it all. Don't leave anything behind. Pull it all out of me. My deepest, darkest secrets, the thing that I've been trying to hide for all of these years, I let it go, and now, God, you heal it. You take it. And what Satan has meant for evil, God, you turn it for good and for your glory. Can you say amen to that? Number three, I've only got four. A perfect heart trusts. I love that I did not know the songs that Vanessa was picking, uh, but so powerful that the ones that she picked would fit so well with my points. But I want you to listen to this part because I think this is going to really hit us in where we are in our lives and where the world is today. If you were to read through David's life, you'll find one major attribute that David displayed his entire life. And here it is. He trusted God. Fifty different times you'll find uh, the word trust, the teaching of it, and what it really means to all of us as we walk through life. But when we look at that word trust... We really need a good understanding of what it means. The word trust in Hebrew gives us a picture of jumping off a precipice. It gives us a picture of a little child who, when his father tells him to jump, that child jumps with a complete and total confidence that when he does, his father is going to catch him. David as he walked through his life, he learned to trust God. Excuse me. Trust is something that all of us have to learn. And I say that because most of the time when we give our hearts and lives to Christ, trust comes to us because we're trusting God to get us out of something. Okay, God, I'm a mess. I got myself into the drugs and the alcohol. I got myself and into this situation and that situation. So, God, I trust that you're going to get me out of this. But the trust that David is talking about is a trust that he had learned by giving his life to God and saying, God, I'm going to jump off the cliff and I'm going to throw myself completely into your hands and you're going to do with my life whatever that you want to do. 
And we know that David learned that because listen to what he says in Psalm 119.71. And you will never say this unless you know Christ. You'll never say this unless you've learned to trust God. You'll never say these next two verses until you can say, God, you know what you're doing. I trust you. Here I am. Listen to what David said. He said, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I went through this time of suffering. Because of it, I learned your statutes. Psalm 119.75, David said, in your faithfulness, You disciplined me. I almost coughed. So if you see me up here struggling because I'm trying to hold it back. Now, church, you'll never say that. You can't say that unless you have completely and totally given your life to the Lord. Oh, church, it's hard. It's hard. You see, I'm trying to tell you that trust is so much more than just God getting you out of your difficult circumstances. It's a trust that says, God, you've ordered my steps. And if you've ordered my steps, Lord, then I trust that you're going to take me where you want me to go. It's saying, God, I trust that you know exactly what it's going to take to to conform me into the image of your Son. God, you need to know, you know the lessons that I need to learn. You know how to test and stretch my faith so that I can become the great man or woman of God that you intended for me to be. God, I don't know how, but you know how to complete the work you started in me. God, I don't know what you're going to do and what you're doing in this moment, why you're allowing this, but I trust you because I know that there's a reason. Now, church, you can't get there overnight. That takes time to walk with God. I'm convinced more than ever that our entire lives, the greatest lesson that we'll ever learn is how to let go and let God. Every single one of us will only let God take us a certain place. And then when we get there, we try to take our life back. And then we try to take our life back. We go a little bit further, but we're going to take our life back. We go a little bit further, but we're going to take it back. But it isn't until you're ready to jump off that cliff, church, and say, God, here am I. And let God catch you and do with you what he wants to do to mold and make you where you become the clay and he becomes the potter. Church, you'll never find the completeness and the fullness of what it really means to walk with God until that moment takes place. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And you say, well, Pastor, I don't know if I can do that. Well, at the same time, you've got to understand that God will never let you go through anything that you can't handle. At the same time, you've got to understand that all those things that you're going through will work out for your good. You know what? One day we've got to stop fighting God and start letting God be God and just trust him. And that's what a perfect heart does. How did David wait 14 years before he became the king? He was anointed king. And then he has to go tend sheep. All those years later, he did not find his role as the king. Don't you think David might have questioned God? God, what am I doing back here on this backside of the desert tending sheep when you've already anointed me to be the king? But he trusted God, church. Some of you are going through some things right now, and that's where God has brought you to a place where all you can do is trust him. But you know what, church? Trust him. Trust him. God will take you to places where it doesn't matter what you do, how you think, how you get the calculator out and try to work it out. You're not going to find the answer. And God does that purposefully so that we can learn how to trust him. You see, that's what a perfect heart does, it trusts. Let me give you the last one. A perfect heart is determined. 
if you were back in Psalm 51 of our text, and I, I want to, in fact, I want to read this together because this is a very interesting word, Psalm 51. Verse 17 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. God, you will not despise. Now, if I asked you to give me a picture of a broken heart, I wonder what you would say. I think of, um, you know, somebody having broken up with a girlfriend or boyfriend or something happening in a relationship and and you would say, oh, that, oh, they broke that person's heart. And I think that would be natural for all of us to look at that, see that picture of somebody who had been broken by something. But there's a, the word here, broken, you've got to catch this. This is so powerful to me. The word that David used here is the same word used in Nehemiah. When Nehemiah describes the destruction of Jerusalem, and he describes it as the walls and the gates have been broken down. Now, if you read the story of Nehemiah, he sees the gates in their condition. They're destroyed. They've been broken down. But he does not live his entire life weeping and crying because of the condition of those walls. Now, I hope you're going to catch this. Nehemiah decided to do something about it and declared, I'm going to rebuild what was broken. Was his heart broken over what he saw? Yes. Did he fast and pray because he was so burdened? Yes. But church, this is the next step of the perfect heart a heart that is so determined to get up and do something about what God has revealed, about what God is doing in your life, about confessing to God and responding to what God is saying and saying, okay, God, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to do something about it because if I stay here, I'll never see a heart that's complete or full. I'll never be who God wants me to be by sitting in this place chained to this place of weeping because of what's happened to my life. Oh, I hope you've got a hold of that, church. David was the same way. He's confronted by what he did. He suffers the consequences by the loss of his first son. Yes, he was broken over it. He put sackcloth and ashes. Yes, he repented, fasted, and prayed, but he did not stay, stay in that place of brokenness, church. He got back up and continued to move forward in his life. Now, church, let me look at you and tell you the world uh, is filled with broken people. Every person in here has been broken, or are you are broken right now. And if not, then get ready because you will be broken. Every single one of us. The difference is those who have been broken and never get over it, and those who have been broken and have moved on. Oh, that's the only difference. All of us have been broken. All of us. But there are many that have been broken and never gotten over it. Never moved away into that place of victory. They live their life by what's happened to them. Or they live their life in the land of regret like I did. So affected and infected by the past. And because of it, it controls who they are and what they're going to ultimately be. Listen, Paul was adamant about us forgetting what is behind and reaching for what lies ahead. In fact, I dare say that you can't reach forward until you let go. As long as you're holding something back here, you can't reach for what is ahead of you. You can't walk forward. You can't run the race. You can't cross the finish line. Why? Because you keep hanging on to what's back here. 
And that's what God is trying to say to us. Listen, David could have wallowed in his pit of despair because of what he'd done with Bathsheba and what he'd done with Uriah. But church, he got up because there was nothing that he could have done about it. And he moved forward with God and let God heal him and bring him to a new place. And that's where many of us are here today. Listen, getting sick and tired of being sick and tired isn't just for drug addicts like me. It's also for the people who are tired of living in their past. Who are tired of letting the devil win. Listen, don't let the devil win. You don't have to live in that place of despair. You can get back up and move forward with Jesus. You can move forward to that finish line. Listen, you can be a new creation. You can have a new life if you'll let God do it. Oh, man, church, I hope this is making sense. I love the story of Isaiah, of God's people chained, and here they are. They're laying in the ground, and they're chained with chains. And Isaiah begins to speak to him, and he's like, what are you doing in the ground? Why you got the chains around you? And God tells and commands his people, stand up. And he tells them, those chains are already loose. There's no lock on them. Get up off the ground and shake yourself, he said, and those chains will fall off. Here's what he was saying. Listen, when you give your life to Christ, he breaks the lock of the chains. Those chains aren't there anymore. Now, the enemy wants you to think that those chains are there. He wants you to be bound by those chains for the rest of your life. But God is saying, get up, shake yourself, and begin to move on and quit sitting there in that place of despair because of what's happened to your life or what you have done in your life. Man, I hope somebody's listening to what I'm saying. Church, listen, everybody's made mistakes. Everybody has wept over what's happened to them and what they have done. Everybody. There's nobody exempt. The key is you're going to sit there and let the enemy win. You're going to sit there living in the past. Oh, you say, well, pastor, it's not that easy. No, I understand that. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying it's necessary. It's necessary. It's never easy to see changes take place in your life. It's never easy to move on. But it is necessary. Church, let God do the work. Let let God do the work. Listen, David could have given up. He had every right to give up. That's big. How do you commit adultery? How do you kill somebody? That's big. But he didn't give up, church. He could have sat there in despair. But instead he responded to God's word. He let God search his heart to expose who he really was on the inside. Because he knew he had to. He had to let God have it all. But more importantly, church, and this is what I want to say as we end, and nobody here is mistake-free, and don't think that I'm taking one thing that you've done and putting it over the other because it's all the same in God's eyes. You've broken one, you've broken them all. I'm not setting categories. It's all big when it's against God and His holiness. But what I am saying is that one day we've got to say, God, I'm ready to move on from this mistake. I'm ready to move on with my life. You do the work. I trust you to do what you got to do to get me where you want me to be. A heart that is filled, full, prepared. That's what it meant. Not a life free from mistakes. But a heart that says, God, here I am, I'm ready. Are you ready, church, to be used? I know that I am.